Hey, good morning. It's uh, seven o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Savings Time and 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean, mean Time. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Ball from Vector Corrosion Technologies, and I wish I want to say hello and welcome to our first webinar Wednesday um, Bridge Preservation Series um, hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. We are happy to have registrations from Angola to Argentina to United Kingdom to United States. And in total, we have over 22 countries around the world who have interest in bridge preservation and have registered for this first seminar series. So it is my pleasure as the moderator to welcome and introduce today's program and our featured speaker, which is Brian Pales from Vector Corrosion Services. The web Webinar Wednesday is a series of monthly educational webinars that are starting today and running through July 2021, addressing the best, the best practices and new innovations in the field of bridge preservation. Future webinar topics will include uh, galvanic and impressed current cathodic protection, non-destructive testing, and post-tension evaluation and tendon impregnation. So just a little bit about the Concrete Preservation Alliance. It's a coalition of organizations that are advancing best practices in the field of preservation, repair, and infrastructure renewal. So working together, our goal is to educate and increase the awareness of concrete and repair industry standards and innovation and prevention technologies. And a key part of what we do is to promote sustainable concrete and construction practices. So today we are sponsoring this se seminar. Uh, the, the Concrete Preservation Alliance also uh, sponsors the educational website, wesavestructures.info, which promotes good repair and, present, and um, presentation practices. Um, so our members uh, include Vector Corrosion Technologies, Vector Corrosion Services, NDT Corporation, and vector construction. All these together are promoting uh, uh, these, uh, the idea of dedica we're dedicated to saving structures and promoting sustainable thinking in construction. So just a note, that, you know, if you know that, um, I don't know if you knew this, but 40% of the solid waste in, in the, uh, comes from construction and, and demolition. And so the idea of promoting sustainability and making structures last longer is good for not only economic sense, but also uh, from a sustainable practices standpoint. So on the We Save Structures website at slash environmental impact calculator, you'll find a, a free online calculator that you can use to determine the environmental impact of keeping structures in place. So simply put in your, your volume of concrete and it actually puts out um, how many tons of CO2 and other pollutants how much solid waste and other natural resources can be um, preserved by keeping st structures in, in place and preserving these structures. Just uh, about today's seminar, um, there is a on the wesavestructure.info, uh, there is an events page, um, which is where you actually registered today. Um, as we complete these, um, these uh, webinars, uh, we will be posting videos back on the events page and then we really encourage you to continue over the next 11 months to um, register for upcoming seminars and come back to the events page frequently. So as I mentioned, today's um, presentation is going to be completed by Dr. Brian Pales. Uh, Dr. Pales is the principal engineer with Vector Corrosion Services, which is a professional engineering services provider. Uh, he is a professional engineer, uh, and for those in the states, he's uh, actually an engineer in many, many states, and uh, is also a certified NACE cathodic protection specialist. Uh, his specialties are non-destructive evaluation, uh, materials, structural evaluation, and assessment of reinforced concrete structures. And, and Brian has uh, the credentials of PhD from in civil engineering from Rutgers, masters from Virginia, 
and uh, his bachelor's degree was in engineering from Northeastern University. He also has a graduate certificate in engineering physics. In addition to all the uh, letters after his name, he's a, a recent father, as so we congratulate him on that. So um, hopefully he got lots of sleep last night. Um, the, the topic of, of Brian's presentation is corrosion assessments for concrete bridge elements. Um, so the, the goals and the learning objectives here is to understand the cause and effect of, of reinforcing steel corrosion in concrete, uh, the understanding the magnitude and extent of corrosion and the risk of corrosion, and understanding many different destructive and non-destructive test methods for assessing corrosion and the corrosion risk. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to, to Brian. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for that. Um, and so where I'd like to start today's talk is just give a quick little background on corrosion. What is the corrosion reaction? What are we looking for when we're doing evaluation? Um, corrosion is an electrochemical reaction. So that means there is electrical current that flows as part of the reaction and there is a chemical reaction. Um, there are two kind of primary parts to the uh, corrosion reaction. There's the anode and the cathode. The anode, most people are familiar with, that's where iron loses an electron and becomes iron oxide. So that's where the red rust kind of was formed and that's where section loss of the steel occurs. Uh, when we lose an electron though, we need to gain an electron somewhere else. And that's where the cathode comes into play and the cathode consumes that freed electron. And so, you know, we have also a, a electronic path between those anodes and cathodes and an ionic current path because we want to complete an electrical circuit and that's through an electrolyte, typically concrete, water, or soil. For reinforced concrete, um, you know, we like steel and concrete because the pH of the concrete protects the steel. Um, concrete is naturally alkaline around a pH of 13, and in that alkalinity, steel is passive. It forms a passive layer and protects the steel from corrosion. However, unfortunately, um, things from the outside environment like chlorides and carbonation will permeate into the concrete and break that passivity, and then that allows for corrosion activity to occur. With regards to damage, really the damage uh, is a progression, right? It starts with metal section loss. The iron becomes iron oxide, so we have a cross-sectional area loss of the steel, and then we have the formation of iron oxide rust. Um, as iron oxide starts to form, it is actually an expansive product. So iron oxide can, depending on the formation, can grow up to seven times the original size of the metal it was consuming. So obviously that's a very expansive material within concrete. And we know that tension leads to cracking of concrete and delamination. And so that iron oxide expands, creates cracks, out of eventual delamination and spalling. And that's all due to the expansive nature of, of the rust that's formed. For conventional mild reinforcing steel, um, in most cases, the steel section loss is not our primary concern. It's more the spalling and delaminating concrete that's coming off, right? We have the column there on our right, and we have a little bit of section loss in the steel, but we've started to get significant spalling and delamination of the concrete. And so when it gets to this point, we typically have visual cues that, okay, we need to address this column. Structurally, it's probably fundamentally fine, but it's starting to deteriorate, and we see signs of that. We need to address it. However, there are high strength elements, pre-stress and post-tension elements. These elements have smaller steel cross-sectional area, so the strands are smaller. They are under significant load. So a little bit of cross-section loss on a strand goes a lot longer as far as affecting the structural stability of an element. And so here we have a on the bottom there a, a precast beam, and you can see the pre-stressing strands in the bottom of that beam have completely corroded and failed. And so the amount of corrosion oxide to create a delamination to see that was was so significant that it already caused um, complete section loss of the strands. So if we wait for the same visual indicators that we do on conventional column reinforcing or conventional reinforcing, we're waiting too late as by the time the delamination is formed and pre-stressing, there's already such significant section loss of that steel that we have a structural issue here. Whereas on the column with mild reinforcing, we don't really have a structural issue just yet. Now, if we let that go, we will, but um, you know, there are indicators before it gets to that point. So today I wanna kinda, you know, kinda, that's a little intro just about corrosion and what we're dealing with. And this kinda takes me into what we're gonna kinda talk about today and also as part of all this web series is the concrete preservation process. 
the and it's a six step thing, a step, six step process where we first want to identify the issue, evaluate the structure and identify the extent of that issue, uh, make sure we understand the cause and then develop a repair strategy, complete that repair and perform quality control. And this process is important in having a reliable, long performing repair um, and preservation of concrete structures. And so today in my talk, I'm only going to be discussing kind of the first two, maybe three points, the identifying issues and uh, uh, evaluating um, uh, evaluating the cause and providing an evaluation. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight too is ACI 562. This is the new uh, concrete repair code. Uh, this is being adopted throughout the US um, in various states. And one of the things that kind of with regards to this presentation I'd like to highlight is that the code requires that an evaluation take place prior to designing repairs. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily specify what exactly evaluation needs to happen, but it's important that some evaluation is uh, taking place so that the designer has a firm understanding of what is the problem, what's the extent of that problem and the cause of that problem. Um, and so this is an, you know, this is a good take on the progression of our industry and is uh, provides a higher level of product at, at the end. So and you know, I kind of want to open this up with talking a little bit about, you know, what are we out there when we're looking and evaluating these structures for deterioration, right? We have here a picture of a of a pier cap, and we've clearly done some hammer sounding on that structure, and we've identified the delamination. Well, is that the end of our evaluation, or is there more going on here, right? So obviously, there's deep bonded concrete there, but is when we go to quantities of repair, when we start chipping that out, is that area going to grow? Most likely, yes. Um, you know, hammer sounding only going to find near surface large delaminations. So what about where the corrosion is active but yet hasn't caused delamination yet or where the delaminations are still small so that it hasn't caused it so it can be found by hammer sounding. So maybe, you know, maybe there's an area of delamination around that area that hasn't been found by hammer sounding. So when I take a chipping hammer to that area, it's going to open up larger. So if maybe I do some better um, upfront evaluation, I can better quantify that area so we don't have a change order down the road. What about maybe looking where the active corrosion is? Maybe there's around that area just beyond it is some still active corrosion that still hasn't caused delamination. So, you know, we see a delamination or we do a visual and sounding inspection and, and yes, we're finding problems, but are those all the problems? And can we use some tools to get a better, more complete picture of that structure? And so that's kind of why, you know, a focus of today will be a lot on non-destructive testing as a way to kind of augment or benefit the typical inspection methodology that we do. Uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, we know sounding and visual inspection are underestimating true repair area, and that can lead to costly change orders, uh, extended project duration. Uh, you know, sometimes also when we do the evaluation, it can take several years before the repairs actually occur. So there's some kind of, there's gonna be an increase in that damage. So how do we kind of better project that increase of damage or the underestimating of repair quantities and limit cost of change orders? Well, maybe if we add in some methods that I'll talk about today, we can understand the deterioration at earlier stages so that we can address it during the repair. And I always kind of like to highlight, you know, a lot of NDT people kind of focus heavily in the bridge market on decks but all these NDT methods can be used on substructure elements and girders and, and different elements of the bridge. And so not just kind of pigeonholing them to decks um, because you know, decks tend to be more of the cheaper repair, but the substructures are extremely important and very costly to replace. So here I, I show kind of what, you know, a general reinforced concrete deterioration is with regards to corrosion. And there are other types of uh, deterioration mechanisms, but obviously I'm going to kind of just highlight on corrosion today. Um, so, you know, we start with chloride and moisture penetrating to the concrete. Um, then, you know, rebar starts to corrode. Then the concrete begins to crack due to the formation of the iron oxide. And that delamination then begins to become a, a spall. And so we have this progression of deterioration over time. And our typical evaluation methods, chain drag and visual inspection, which are extremely important tools. However, they're really only finding the late stage deterioration. Uh, chain drag can only find large near surface delaminations kind of late, right before they start spalling off. 
visual inspection, you know, anything that's at the surface, large cracking, spalls, that's what visual is going to identify. But when we look at a structure, we know that there's more of these conditions happening simultaneously on a structure. If I have a spall in one place, I know I'm going to have probably rebar corrosion somewhere else that doesn't, hasn't created a delamination or spall yet. So how do I better identify the complete condition of a structure? Maybe I can use corrosion potential measurements or half cell, uh, ground penetrating radar, uh, impact echo. So different methodologies like these I can implement to get a more complete picture and understanding of that condition. And I'll touch base on each one of these here at this afternoon. As I said, you know, visual inspection is still important and I don't want to dismiss it as being antiquated. You know, we need to be looking at structures, looking where the rust staining is, where's cracking, where's water seepage. Um, that photo in the middle, that's a construction joint and you can see water is transporting through that construction joint quite aggressively. Um, you have rust staining there, efflorescence. These are things that are important in any evaluation is to do a visual, a complete visual assessment of the structure to identify any areas of potential deterioration. And these visual indicators can usually give you an indication of what's happening within the structure as well. Hammer sounding is, you know, a very um, important method as well. It, it is a form of non-destructive testing, right? Where we're dragging chains or impacting the structure with a hammer, listening for those hollow sounds where we find large near surface delaminations. And, but it's important to understand its limitations, right? If we hear that hollow sound, we know, okay, yes, there's delamination there. Um, it makes a very clear sound. It's, it's not common that if you hear that noise, there isn't a delamination. However, there will be areas where we don't hear that hollow sound, but the concrete could be deteriorated. So there's a lot of false negatives that are coming from hammer sounding. Where we find those delaminations are not the ex full extent of the damage. And so we need to use more methodologies to really fully understand the extent of that deterioration. Uh, collection of cores is obviously really important. Um, you know, this is destructive uh, methodology, but it tells us a lot about the uh, condition of the concrete and also can help us verify our non-destructive and visual testing results. And so collecting cores on a structure is extremely important. And so here, you know, this gentleman here is, is, is doing a wet core of a, of a bridge deck and we can sample that core for chloride concentration with depth. So we can sample that core in half inch increments and look at what the chloride concentration at the various steps are. And that'll tell us a lot about the risk for corrosion and the exposure environment. Um, and so we see we have five lines here from five different cores. And so we've sampled each core in half inch increments. And you can see three of those lines have very high surface chlorides. So, you know, typically a bridge deck with deicing chemicals, you'll have a high surface concentration. And then as you move deeper into the concrete, it that concentration decreases with depth because those chlorides haven't reached deeper just yet. So, um, you know, typically chloride threshold maybe around 350 parts per million. You can see those three lines are below that value at, at say two inches of cover. So two inches of cover is not uncommon on bridge structures. So those structure, those three cores, um, the steel's at a low risk for corrosion activity. The other two cores clearly are well above that value, and there's a high risk for corrosion activity there. Uh, most likely uh, there's cracking in that concrete that's allowed chlorides to get deeper into that concrete quicker. Uh, carbonation depth is another method that um, not a lot of people, you know, chlorides are typically the first thing people think of when we think of corrosion, but carbonation is very common as well where carbon dioxide in the environment will react with the free line in the concrete and lower the pH of the concrete. And so that carbonation front will move into the concrete, lower the pH, and when that lowered pH front reaches the steel, it'll break the passivity and cause corrosion activity. And so here's a core and they've sprayed a pH indicator solution on that core. And you can see the clear part is where the pH is low. And then the pink part is or pink or purple is where the pH is high. And so we can measure where that front is. And then depending on where that front is and in relation to the cover depth, that'll tell us about the risk for corrosion uh, for that structure. And so, and then we can also model how long it'll take for that front to reach the steel if it hasn't already. So what are some important methodologies that we also use for non-destructive testing? Um, as far as corrosion goes, one of the most um, useful tools in, in my toolbox is corrosion potential measurements. Uh, this measurement is where we take a reference electrode, uh, typically copper, copper sulfate, and we measure the potential of that reference electrode against the steel reinforcement in a concrete structure. 
And that potential difference will tell us the probability or risk for active corrosion at that location. And so here you can see this gentleman, he's clearly sounded out where the delaminations are on this pier. And if we just went out and repaired where those delaminations are, are we truly repairing the structure for 30 more year service life or, or 50 or whatever it may be? Or if I only repair these delaminations, will corrosion cause more delaminations in different areas in the next five years? So if I don't really understand where the active corrosion is beyond this delamination, then I really can't provide a good repair strategy. And so by doing the corrosion potential in addition to sounding, he can not only identify where, where the concrete damage is today, but potentially where it will be in the future. And maybe we can do something to mitigate it before it becomes concrete damage. Um, so this is an example of a bridge deck, doing a survey on a bridge deck. And you can see there's a lot of hot, warm colors on there, a lot of active corrosion on this in this bridge deck. And the owner wanted to know uh, for this bridge deck, it was, it was getting very old and he was thinking that he would need to replace it, but he wanted to understand, well, could we save some money and just do some um, repairs now and delay replacement? And so we, we need to understand not only what the damage is today, but what is the damage gonna be in the near future? So if we do half sell, we can see there's obviously a lot of active corrosion on the structure. And if we overlay a sounding survey on top of that, we can see, okay, well, there is quite a bit of delamination, but that delamination is going to grow significantly in the near future because clearly there's a lot of active corrosion around those d -lamps. So if I had just gone and done a hammer sound, I maybe could have said, well, maybe we can just repair it now and then we'll worry about it later. But with the half cell combined, you know, is it really worth it to repair these d -lamps when we know they're just going to get bigger much quicker in a very relatively short period of time? So this can help drive the decisions for this owner on, on this structure. And ultimately he decided to replace this deck. Uh, for a substructure, this is a, um, a railroad bridge and you can see it's a little hard maybe to see in the photo, but this railroad bridge is almost actually at grade and the road dips down below the bridge. And so well, because of the elevation change of the road, water and chlorides pool down in underneath this bridge because of the depression. And what will happen and what was happening is salts from the de-icing chemicals because this is a, a snow area. Um, we're getting splashed up onto the piers um, because of cars driving by and the moisture running down into this area. So it was a very aggressive environment on the lower portion of these piers and they wanted to understand where the active corrosion was. So by doing corrosion potentials on the columns and the crash wall there, we could identify where the active corrosion was. And you can see the kind of the hot spots on the lower six feet of the columns. And you can see the hatching there identifying where the delaminations were. Um, and so now we can identify, okay, you know, the columns do have some problems, but it's mostly the affecting the lower elevation. So what can we do to address that? Um, one thing that's kind of interesting that stands out is that the crash wall is not nearly as active as the columns. And you would say, well, you know, the crash wall should be closer to the road surface where there's more salt and more water. Why isn't that actively corroding as well? And it all actually has to come back to do with cover depth, is that the cover depth in the crash wall was a little bit deeper than the cover depth in the columns. So while the exposure environment was similar for both elements in that region, the chlorides just hadn't reached the depth of steel for the crash wall yet because the steel was a little deeper. So cover depth played an important role in the longevity of the crash wall versus the shorter uh, service life of the columns. Uh, GPR is a very useful and robust tool that we use in the evaluation of structures. Um, GPR is an electromagnetic evaluation of concrete. It sends an electromagnetic wave into the concrete and that wave will reflect off of various things. And that reflection and the looking at those reflections, we can tell a lot about a structure. Um, what reflects GPR waves very well is steel. Um, steel is a conductor. And so GPR waves will reflect very well off of a, a conductor. And so you can see in the screen on the top there where the white hyperbolas, those are the rebar reflections. And we can see where those rebars are quite clearly. So GPR is really good at finding the location of embedded metal. So we can identify not only the spacing, but the cover depth of reinforcement, um, especially helpful in older structures where we don't have plans. Uh, and we can also do a qualitative condition assessment. So um, on that screen, you see that the, uh, the rebar is nice and bright on the left there, but on the right, it starts to fade. And the reflection of the GPR is weaker there. 
And what can cause that is if the concrete is severely deteriorated, that'll affect the signal. If there's a lot of moisture or chlorides in the concrete, that'll affect the signal. There's a lot of things that are associated with concrete deterioration that will affect the signal. Now, I can't tell you whether or not that's a delamination there or if it's just moisture exposure, but I know that there's potentially an issue there. And so that may be an area I want to focus, say, a core on in the future or do half cell on later. And so using GPR to look at the attenuation, we can kind of identify areas of further study. Um, so this is a project where we use GPR to locate the existing reinforcement. Um, the owner suspected that there may be an issue with the reinforcement on these adjacent box beams. They're pre-stressed um, segments. And if you look at the uh, kind of the top screen there, that was what the design was. So the design had uh, 12 strands across the three sections there and then 27 strands on the bottom two rows of strands. And so we went out there with the GPR and, and surveyed these, these sections and looked at where the strands were actually placed and found that actually there were only seven strands along the top and 19 total strands along the bottom. So quite a significant departure from the design uh, drawings. Um, however, it's important to know that the the strands were actually bigger in diameter than what was designed. So the presumption was maybe that the precaster didn't have the right size strand, and so he increased the strand and then used less of it. However, that wasn't really approved by the engineer. So um, had you know, it was unclear if proper calculations had been done to ensure that the right amount of steel was was in those elements. And so there is an issue where you know verifying what's in place versus what's on drawings or or verifying for lack of drawings, GPR is very effective at. Um, I mentioned cover depth is extremely important um, in the service life of structures. Uh, GPR is good at measuring in place cover depth, so it can locate how deep the rebar is, and we can use that to model service life for a structure. Um, why cover depth is so important. Um, this equation here in, in orange is the chloride diffusion equation. And effectively, the equation says, what's the concentration of chloride with depth X at some time T? And if we rearrange that equation to solve for time, so we want to know how long it'll take for the C sub X T to reach the chloride threshold, we see that X is squared, and that's the depth to the rebar. So if, if depth has an exponential impact on T, that means that the better cover depth we have, that has an exponential impact on service life of our structure. And for carbonation of concrete, that equation on the right, that's the model carbonation. Um, you can see again, D is squared. So, so cover depth of steel has a large impact on service life of a structure. So if we're wanting to model the service life of a structure, cover depth is probably the first thing we want to measure. We want to know what the in-place cover depth is so that we can understand its service life. Um, and so that's, you know, we do that commonly. Um, this happens to be uh, a bridge piers columns. And so they were having some uh, localized corrosion problems where there was some spalling concrete and they wanted to know what the remaining service life was. And so we did a GPR survey of those columns and identified that, well, the reason we're getting some spalling is that because there's some low cover areas. There's some areas of inadequate cover that has allowed carbonation to get to the steel very quickly and cause localized corrosion. And so while this isn't a, a global problem for the column, it is more, okay, we need to address these localized areas where the cover was improper so that we these areas don't affect the overall service life of the structure. Um, we also can do, um, you know, the GPR amplitude survey that I mentioned. Um, this is looking at a bridge in Florida. And in Florida, we typically, um, you know, we don't have snow, so we don't have a lot of deck problems because we don't put de-icing salts down. Typically, our issues are from the marine environment on the substructure because that's where the salt water is. However, this bridge was a little unique in that you can see on the left side of that bridge, there is a marina. And so on the weekends, people, you know, obviously put their boats in the water, go out fishing, and when they come back, they pull them out of, out of the water from that marina and then drive them across the bridge. And so these boats that recently came out of the salt water are then driving immediately over a bridge. And so salt water is dripping off of these off of these boats. And you can see that on the eastbound lane, down almost the center of the lane, there is a lot of attenuation in the signal. And that GPR is picking up where there's moisture, chlorides, and deterioration exposure from that salt water dripping from the boat, whereas the westbound lane has little to none. 
And so we can quantify where that exposure is through the GPR survey, which is a very rapid test, and we can scan that bridge very quickly. Now that we know where the areas of potential deterioration are, we can then go take some cores to see, well, and some chain drag or half cell, and we can identify, is there active corrosion there or delaminations, or is it just getting moisture and chlorides right now? And if we do some preventative maintenance, we can prevent delaminations. So the GPR tells us we need to look closer at this area, but it doesn't necessarily tell us exactly the problem. And so this kind of hones in our, our focus and our resources to the area that needs it. Acoustic methods are another important um, methodology that we use in non-destructive testing. Uh, acoustic methods use stress waves in concrete to evaluate the condition. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two primarily, um, the first being impact echo. Um, impact echo is where we, we impact say a slab or a wall and the stress wave will resonate in that thickness at a certain frequency. And that frequency is related to the velocity of the wave through that material and also the thickness. And so if there's sound concrete, we, we, we kind of know what that resonant frequency should be for that section and thickness. Um, however, if there's say a delamination, that resonant frequency will occur at a higher frequency because it'll bounce between the delamination and the surface. So the thickness of that element has fundamentally changed um, when the, due, to the, um, due to that air boundary in the delamination. Or if there's a lot of micro cracking or issues in the concrete, it can cause the signal to be lost and we, we don't pick it up. So impact echo is really good at identifying, say, horizontal uh, issues like delaminations or measuring the thickness of uh, unknown slabs uh, and things of that nature. In addition, because we, we use a sensor array when we collect this acoustic measurement info, um, we have four sensors at known spacing. And so when we create a stress wave in the structure, we not only create a compressional wave that radiates out, but we also create surface waves. And measuring the velocity of those waves between the sensors at, at a known spacing, we can measure the velocity of those waves. And understanding velocity of the waves can also tell us other things about the condition of the structure. Uh, you know, if the structure is good sound concrete, that wave velocity will be high. If there's a lot of micro cracking or deterioration, it'll reduce the velocity of that wave. And so by using impact echo and pulse velocity simultaneously together with this array, we can fully assess the, the condition of the structure and identify cracking and delamination. Um, the wave velocity is directly related to the compressive strength. And so one of the things too, we also get out of that is kind of an estimate on the in-situ concrete compressive strength. And so strength is related to wave velocity. And so by going across the structure, we can get better in place concrete uh, compressive strengths to understand if there's areas of low compressive strength or if the compressive strength that meets the project requirements. And so what does this look like on, on a deck? We have kind of a deck rolling unit that will roll. And so um, you can see it's got some wheels there in the front and effectively a computer and an impactor and the gentleman just pushes that along and it automatically impacts the concrete as um, the structure as it moves along. And so you can see this is kind of a diagram of this. So we have kind of three leading sensors and then one trailing sensor. And so on the three leading sensors, the wave is traveling transversely to the bridge deck. And so any longitudinal cracking will get picked up by that, by that transverse signal. And then on that trailing sensor, that trailing signal will get picked up, will be able to be affected by transverse cracking. So, so based on this, um, the two dimensional um, layout of our sensors, we can pick up the uh, cracks in both uh, dimensions. And then also um, we can get delaminations in that horizontal plane below the surface um, with the impactor is right next to number one there. And so that signal also is sent down and back up. And so we're collecting delaminations as well. So with the, with the impact device that we have and the arrangement of the sensors, we, not, we can pick up cracks in both in all directions and also horizontal delaminations um, and cracking. Um, and so what does this you know, look like as regards to a result? And so the result here, this is, a, um, this is the result from a bridge deck where we did that impact echo testing over the whole surface area. And you can see where the impact echo devices identified delaminations as these orange and hot spots. Um, 
you'll see on there there's a few locations in um, in some of the spans where there's a black circle and that's where the hammer sounding delamination chain drag identified uh, debonded concrete so you can see obviously there's a great uh, correlation between the impact echo uh, pulse velocity and the chain drag but obviously the chain drag is limited right chain drag is limited by the human ear we're dragging that chain and it's it's causing the vibration of the concrete and so we can only hear with our human ears a certain frequency range whereas with the impact echo device because we have a uh, fancier sensors we can pick up a much broader uh, wide spectrum and so we can identify delaminations much much earlier before they become large near surface that we would pick up with with a hammer sound um, we can also do this on um, you know vertical elements so this is a, an abutment wall actually this is a tunnel structure and so we can see there's the handheld version of the array and the impactor. So that's me up in the lift there with the array in one hand and the impactor in the other and the gentleman monitoring the signals. And we can do testing over an area to identify issues in, in those elements. And so what is the result from that? So this is the results from that project actually. And so what we did on that one, so there was a, an area of a vertical joint in the, uh, in the tunnel wall. And first we did sounding to identify where deterioration was. And we hatched out, there was a lot of delamination around either side of the joint. And then actually there was a little delamination near the floor there between five and nine feet. And so that's what we picked up with just hammer sounding alone. Then we go with the impact echo pulse velocity device. And the impact echo portion of that device identified not only the same area as impact uh, as hammer sounding, but it also found these tan regions. And it said, oh, well, you know, near the joint off to the right, there's a little bit extra area there that's debonded. And then also along the bottom, that's a much larger area that actually connects with the joint there. So if we had just used the hammer sounding, we would have greatly underestimated the debonded concrete area. And once we started hitting that with the chipping hammer, most likely all that would start to open up. But also the benefit of, of the impact echo and pulse velocity together is, is this isn't the full story, right? There, this is just telling us where there's deep bonded concrete. There could be micro cracking and other issues affecting the concrete that haven't really just formed the whole debond yet. And so by doing the pulse velocity, we can identify areas of weakened concrete where there's starting to be micro cracking or other is issues and so we can see those areas of lower velocity as the yellow and red, and we can see that those extend a little bit further out from the um, the impact echo and sounding. So, so together, when we combine those all together, we can get a better understanding of actually where the repair area is. And so after that, we can then you know mark out this segment and say, okay, this is the area most likely we're going to have to chip out and replace because this is all deteriorated concrete. And so we have a much different results um, from the combination of those evaluation techniques as opposed to just relying on sounding. Uh, infrared thermography is another methodology that we use uh, fairly frequently. Um, this is a good tool in uh, assessing large surface areas of delaminations rather quickly. Um, infrared thermography, so when delaminations form, there's they separate from the main concrete structure and there's a little air void behind them. So there are thin sections. So in the morning sun, the laminations will heat up faster because there's less concrete mass there. And in the evening, when the sun goes down, they'll cool much faster. So using an infrared uh, camera, we can monitor a surface area and watch the morning heating or the evening cooling, and we'll see these hot spots or cool spots emerge where there's delaminations. And so here on the bottom, this is a, a an abutment where you can kind of see um, we're, we're monitoring a couple of locations, uh, a face of it, and you can see over time in the morning, these two locations heated up rather fast compared to the rest of the structure. And those are areas where there's clearly a delamination formed. Um, infrared thermography is very similar to chain drag. It's going to give you very similar results. But if you have a very large area that you, know, you can't test by hand, infrared thermography provides an alternate to that solution. Um, one kind of unique situation we used it in was there was this arch bridge where they had done a full visual and sounding inspection of the structure, but it had been several years and they were about to go to a bid with the construction documents and they wanted to verify that the repair areas hadn't grown too much. And so had they, they gave us the hammer sounding and visual inspection and we used infrared cameras 
to just verify without having to get close to the structure that, OK, yes, these areas that were delaminated, they have not grown too much or yes, they've kind of grown together here. So we're just trying to kind of help verify the hammer sounding results before it goes to construction. Um, and so, you know, this helped in not needing a bucket truck or other expensive access where we could just use infrared thermography as a quick method to to kind of verify some results. Um, and the, the last uh, kind of technique, and this is another material type technique when we pull cores, is looking at petrography. Uh, looking at the concrete matrix is important when we're looking at the rehabilitation of structures. Um, you know, here we have, uh, you know, we're looking at on the microscopic or um, on the cross section of these cores, and we're really wanting to look at, is there any chemical deterioration mechanisms happening in the concrete? Um, and what's the condition of that? And so here, these cores show uh, alkali silica reaction. You can see the cracking of the aggregate. Uh, there's gel forming inside those cracks. Um, this is a, uh, an issue that can, you know, really affect the rehabilitation strategy we use down the road. So if we if we don't do if we don't understand the concrete material makeup and we design a repair strategy that could exasperate alkali silica reaction, that will really affect the ability of our of our service life extension. So doing things like petrography can help to make sure that we're not going to cause more problems than than we're trying to solve. And so you know sometimes you have reactive aggregates that maybe aren't causing gel and causing cracking. And so you want to just make sure your repair strategies don't aggravate ASR or cause worse problems. Or if you have a major ASR problem, maybe it's not worth spending a lot of money on rehab if you have a major ASR problem and, and need to replace that element. So, so petrography can be helpful in dictating some direction with regards to rehabilitation strategies and, and making sure you're not causing more problems than you're, you're trying to solve. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Chris to uh, for some questions. Okay. Hey, um, um, okay. Hey, feedback here. Feedback so, here. so thank you, thank, thank you, you, Brian, Brian, for the, uh, the excellent presentation. Um, we do have we, we did have a lot of questions coming in, and um, probably can't get to them to them all. But um, I'll go through a few which I think would be of interest to the to the group. Um, there was a question about GPR. Um, and we you had the example of using GPR for uh, evaluating the condition, the existing condition of a beam. Um, and uh, the question was uh, related to when would you want to do that versus using existing plans when looking at load ratings? And if there's anything in that particular situation that kind of led you to be looking at it with, uh, with GPR. Well, I think the, the GPR was in, in combination with doing a load rating, right? So they wanted to verify what the reinforcement was to help do calculations to determine what kind of capacity the element had. Uh, so understanding where the reinforcement is, is is really helpful in those structural analysis calculations and verifying that it was placed properly. Because as you saw, you know, it's that the reinforcement was significantly different. So that had a big impact on those on the capacity of that of that element. So the GPR was really in addition and helping the load rating. Yeah, I think it's also uh, that that process is, occurs many times when there you have you know particularly, particularly smaller structures when there aren't any plans available, um, or if you have some some idea that that you want to double check the the actual condition from because there's always variation versus uh, some level of variation versus construction. Um, the other another question is related to acoustic testing uh, through uh, tarmac. So this would be someone from the UK, but just uh, through asphalt and asphalt overlay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it depends on the, the situation, but if you have any comments about about that. Um, fundamentally, the the pavement because of the elasticity of asphalt. Generally speaking, impact echo pulse velocity will not work through it. Um, however, if it's really stiff, like usually like let's just say if it's really cold. So if, if the temperature is really low and I'm talking like freezing, it makes the pavement hard and then we can pass the signal through it. But if, if it's warm outside, um, you know, there's some softness to asphalt. And so when you impact it, it that signal will attenuate very rapidly. So um, so generally speaking, it generally does not work through pavement. However, in, there are unique situations where it can. 
Uh, but I would say as a rule of thumb, you know, you, you tend, if you see you have asphalt, you tend not to want to recommend impact echo, but we can do it from the underside of the slab. So um, on structures that have pavement overlays, we've done it on the underside to assess the full thickness of the of the concrete as well. So so there are ways around it, but it, it is can be a limiter. Yep, staying on the same topic, um, what about your regular surfaces? Uh, it depends on the irregularity, like, you know, like, for example, let's just say, um, you know, an exposed aggregate surface can be problematic sometimes for making good contact with the sensors. Uh, we've used, you know, there's uh, contact gels and things like that to help improve that. Um, it really depends on the level of roughness, you know, generally like bridge decks in the states, they can be grooved and that generally speaking doesn't cause a lot of problems. Uh, we can get good enough contact. Uh, but I would say if you had like an exposed aggregate surface where, you know, where they've cast it and then they've done a water blast to kind of expose the aggregate, make it rocky, that can potentially be an issue with making good contact. But again, we can use things like gels and other things to help improve that. Okay. Um, I th we've had two questions on Schmidt hammer. Do you want to just um, <laughs> j address that from a general standpoint rather than go through both questions? Yeah, um, you know, Schmidt hammer, uh, you know, one thing about Schmidt hammer to keep in mind is Schmidt hammer is a surface hardness test, even though a lot of people think it will tell you in situ compressive strength, it's really more a surface hardness test. So just kind of be cautious of that. Um, and so I would say, you know, there's, you, and you have to calibrate on the concrete material itself. That's, there's a lot of calibration that's really needed for using Schmidt hammer in the field. Um, and so um, it's not as a perfect replacement for say something like pulse velocity, where you're actually sending the wave through the full section and truly getting a, a, an institute compressive strength, whereas Schmidt hammer is a little bit more surface hardness actually. Excellent. Um, Another question, um, which is something that uh, is a really good question, is uh, corrosion rate versus corrosion potential. Any comments on one versus the other? And and uh, I know we typically do a lot more corrosion potential testing, but there's obviously a, a place for both. Right. So obviously, so corrosion potential tells you the risk of active corrosion today. So is is it corroding today? Yes or no? With a probability. It's not really yes or no. It's a probability. Corrosion rate will tell you what's the rate at which the corrosion is occurring at that location you're testing. So if you find in a location with a high probability of active corrosion, you can then do corrosion rate to say, well, how fast is that corrosion occurring? Is it slow or is it at or fast? I would say the be caution, the one caution I always kind of say about corrosion rate is that it's it's an instant in time, right? You're doing that measurement today, and corrosion rate is very dynamic, um, daily, seasonally yearly you know if it's winter months obviously corrosion rate is going to be slower than summer months um you know depending on recent rains it can be faster than so corrosion rate can fluctuate significantly so if you want to do corrosion rates i always recommend at least getting a couple of measurements on a structure over different periods of time because that'll give you a better understanding of corrosion rate because if you get just one measurement at today that measurement may, may not really be representative of the structure so it's important to be cautious with corrosion rate. It can be very helpful in understanding deterioration and rate, but it is, it's a little bit more time consuming test. And it, and if you're not careful with the results, you can kind of be a little misleading. Yep. Another question about corrosion potentials. Um, when you're doing your corrosion potential mapping, what kind of, what range of potentials uh, do you expect around delaminations? That's a good question. Um, delaminations can actually cause the potentials to be um, air because of the air gap when the delamination forms. And that will actually break the electrical continuity between the reference electrode and the steel. It's not always the case. Sometimes it's in enough contact or there's moisture there. So, so I have seen half cell potentials that look passive or look off on delaminations because of the air void. But I've also seen um, at delaminations half cells be very negative. Half cell does not measure where a delamination is. So whether or not the delamination is there, it can affect the half cell in different ways. So if you're trying to relate a potential value to a delamination, that's not really possible. Um, it's just telling you whether or not corrosion is active today. And like I said, the air void can actually cause you to miss, you know, it can cause it to look like a passive zone when it's debonded, even though you know obviously corrosion's occurred there. Yeah, I think that just reiterates the reason that you do more than one type of test. Um, right, exactly. On a, 
on a structure. Um, staying with corrosion potentials, uh, comments on copper, copper sulfate versus silver, silver chloride corrosion um, reference electrodes and um, so when you would use them. For, for those of you who are not familiar, there are different types of reference electrodes. I, I happen to mention copper sulfate, uh, silver, silver chloride is a very popular one. Um, as far as um, looking at reinforced concrete structures in the atmosphere above the waterline, copper sulfate or silver chloride are both very effective. And honestly, I, I don't think I have a preference. I personally just use copper sulfate more, but it's just more readily available here in the States. I don't think there's really that big of a difference for that. Uh, for submerged structures, however, there is a very big difference. Uh, when you're looking at elements below the waterline and you're putting a reference electrode in the water, you definitely want to be using silver chloride or, or a variation of silver chloride. There are different types for certain underwater applications because they're more stable in that environment. Copper sulfate, especially in salt water, will very much shift. And um, so that's what I would say to that is if you're if you're looking below the waterline, especially near brackish or salt water, you want to be using silver chloride or silver seawater reference electrodes because they yeah. don't drift. All right, well, let's wrap it up on a couple of just a couple of questions that are similar on the on chloride uh, testing. Uh, first of all, you referenced uh, 350 parts per million or one and a half pounds per cubic yard. Um, is that the question was, you know, basically water versus acid soluble chlorides in, the, in those uh, thresholds that you're using? Right. So the, the threshold that I'm using, um, so uh, one to two pounds of per cubic yard of uh, uh, one to two pounds of chloride per cubic yard of concrete is kind of generally the threshold range. And that is acid soluble. Um, it's important to know what the difference is between the two. Um, Water soluble, you're only measuring the free chloride in the concrete. Acid soluble, when you digest the sample, because there's there's naturally occurring chloride in aggregate that you'll you'll measure. There's naturally occurring chloride in in water, like in just normal tap water. There's a little bit of trace chloride in there. Um, there in cement products, there's some trace chloride. So when you do acid soluble, you measure every bit of chloride in that sample. Whereas water sam water uh, uh, water um, soluble, you're only measuring the free chloride that's available for corrosion. And so your threshold would be a little bit lower. Um, the issue though is, is that water soluble can be a little bit tougher of a test. It's more expensive, it's more time consuming, um, and it's uh, not always as repeatable as acid soluble. So people tend to do acid soluble just because of that and, and then just kind of um, adjust their threshold. The one thing I would be cautious of, of people doing is there are some aggregates out there that are naturally high in chloride concentration that you will get a high chloride concentration from acid soluble, but because that chloride is bound in the aggregate, that chloride is not available for corrosion. And I'll, the specific one I know off the top of my head is dolomitic limestone in the upstate New York region and areas of that area. You, uh, there's dolomitic limestone and they use it in concrete. So you can get really high um, acid soluble results, but when you compare it to the water soluble, they're much lower. So always be cautious of the aggregate makeup and, you know, when you're doing acid soluble because you are getting a combination of those and, and just, you know, understanding, you know, what you're doing is important and making sure that you're, you know, making the right conclusions from that kind of data. Yeah. I just had one other question that came in I, that I thought was uh, very, it's very specific, but I think it'd be worthwhile to, to, to go through. Um, so this is re with regard to uh, pre-stressed concrete beams um, beneath basically worn or older asphalt overlay that's collecting water underneath and you're having corrosion of the reinforcing bars and the strands mm -hmm. uh, in the beams. And um, there's no shop drawings. What would you do to recommend to evaluate the, the kind of the extent of the deterioration on the top of the bottom surfaces? Of that. I would probably start off with GPR. When I have an asphalt overlay and I want to look at the concrete just below that, I generally start with, say, GPR because GPR can see through the pavement fairly easily and look at that rebar. And so I want to do an attenuation survey to kind of see, well, where are some issues? And, you know, it's always, I would caveat that with, you know, you're going to get moisture trapping, trapping in the pavement as well. So that will attenuate the signal. So I've done some GPR surveys over pavement. And I've seen large areas of attenuation, but that was because of a, a drainage problem where 
there was water getting trapped between the waterproofing and the asphalt and the binder. And so I was getting a lot of an attenuation, but there was no problem with the concrete below. So maybe as a first pass, you do GPR to identify, okay, where do I see potential attenuation? Then maybe do some select coring or openings to do some verification to see what's below that. Because it's only GPR in that situation is only going to give you kind of the point you in in the right direction, but it's going to give you some areas that potentially are fine and some areas that are good. So you kind of have to sift through that a little bit. But I would probably start with GPR as my first piece and, and supplement coring based on that data. Okay, I, I lied and we're gonna do one more question. <laughs> uh, your, we have great questions here, everyone. I really appreciate the participation. Um, question with regard to infrared thermography. Um, is it only, can you only use it when you have a heat source such as the sun? Um, yes and no. I've seen some people who use it when there's like, like on tanks, and this isn't really related to the bridge market, but like a tank that has something heating inside of it, you can see delaminations on the outside because of that thermal change. You need some thermal source. Now, it doesn't necessarily be, need to be the sun, but for concrete structures that are large, it kind of, you know, the sun's the best place. And for bridges, it's really the only source. I know certain industrial sites I've dealt with where the contents inside something can be the heat source and show the laminations on the outside and stuff. Uh, the only other thing I've seen done is I know I've seen people use infrared thermography to identify coating blisters and they have used like photo lights and they've held it near it. And that's kind of the only non, you know, non sun source that I've really seen. But for concrete, because it's so thick and big, mm -hmm. um, for, especially for bridges, it's really, really just the sun. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, uh, we didn't get to all the questions and I, I apologize if you didn't, but um, I wanted to put up um, Brian's contact information. So you see his email address and his office phone number. If you want to reach out to Brian, he's based in Tampa, but he'd be happy to uh, work with you guys or address any questions that you have in the US, Canada, other parts of the world as, as well. Um, but I want to thank Brian for his time today uh, and for joining us on our first webinar Wednesday uh, program. And we appreciate you sharing your your expertise and professional experience with everyone. And on behalf of the Concrete Preservation Alliance, I wanted to thank you for that. And I want to thank in particular all of our attendees. We had a really excellent turnout of not only the number of countries, but people from um, just the total volume of, of, of people online has been has been uh, really, really outstanding. So reach out to Brian uh, for more e uh, questions if we weren't able to um, follow, uh, basically answer those online here. Um, do want to mention uh, professional development certificates. If you need a certificate of attendance right now, you can scan the QR code um, or you will be getting a an email after the after the um, uh, after the meet, meeting here, and you'll have a survey to fill out, just a, a, a brief um, presentation evaluation. And we really appreciate all your comments, and so we can incorporate into the your comments into future uh, future uh, webinar presentations that we have. Um, so you need to complete complete the webinar evaluation. Uh, I know I think Renee is also going to uh, drop the link into the the webinar chat. So look for that as well if you'd prefer to to go go that route. Just a reminder, um, once again, this is the first in our Wednesday webinar program on bridge preservation. Uh, the first was first one was uh, evaluation and um, and testing. Uh, by Brian, and then uh, one month we'll be we'll be talking about uh, we'll have Dr. Sergi coming in from the United Kingdom. He's technical director for for Vector Corrosion Technologies Limited. He'll be discussing galvanic uh, protection for concrete repairs, the kind of the history and the development of the of the systems and long term performance and test data and applications. Uh, so that's going to be on September seventh. Once again, we're going to have two. Uh, live broadcast and you see the times there. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, yours truly will be, will be talking about rather than just small concrete repairs, what do we do when we have more severely corroded structures and talk about galvanic encasing, encasements. And um, 
but um, I think we're just butting up to our, our one hour time period. Um, it's a reminder that the recording of today's seminar uh, or webinar, along with the upcoming registrations, is on the events page on wesavestructures.info. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend. We really appreciate, appreciate that, and it's a commitment that uh, we hope you receive something back for your participation in, in, the, in the information. Um, and for a lot of you, you're, a lot of you, you're logging in at an inconvenient hour, so we appreciate that as well. But as in uh, today's interesting times that we're dealing with, we want everyone to be safe and working together. Let's go save some structures. Thank you very much. This is Chris Ball from Vector Corrosion Technologies signing out.